Welcome to a new chapter in macroeconomics. Okay, we will be talking about everybody's favorite topic, okay, the demand and supply of money. So this topic is actually going to help you um, to understand the liquidity preference and money market equilibrium, which is also known as your LM curve. I'm sure everybody knows what money is, but what we might not know is what are the functions of money from a macroeconomic perspective. So when we talk about these functions, we're actually comparing money uh, with barter trading. And barter trading is basically using goods and services to buy and sell certain goods and services, right? So the first function of money is that it acts as a unit of account, okay? So instead of like using one cow, um, three kilograms of flour, and uh, two cats to value certain goods and services, we can actually use you know a dollar, five dollars, or ten dollars to account for the value of certain goods and services. If you go to a supermarket, I'm sure you want to see price tags with money values in it instead of, okay, so this pack of flour is going to cost you a quarter of a cow. The next function of money is that it acts as a means of exchange. I think this one is pretty obvious. So instead of bringing like cows, uh, bags of flour, and cats to go shopping, uh, we can instead use cash to trade for certain goods and services. So money is more for convenience now, right? I mean, you can put cash into your wallet, you can put cash um, you know, into your Louis Vuitton bag, um, but you can't really put cats, uh, cows, and bags of flour into your shopping bag or wallet when you want to go shopping. The last function of money is that it acts as a store of value. So instead of storing your wealth and value of certain goods and services as um, the amount of cows, bags of flour, and cats, um, you can actually store wealth and value in terms of money. So imagine if your boss were to pay you your paycheck in terms of um, the number of cows and cats. The problem is that your cows and cats are going to die one day. So you can't really store your wealth. You can't really store value. So that's why we use money instead. So money is known to be a liquid asset. Okay, so what is a liquid asset? A liquid asset is basically assets that can be easily bought and sold for cash. Okay, so... Um, since cash is already cash, so that makes money your most liquid form of assets that anybody can hold. Now that we've got the basics of money out of the way, we can now talk about the demand for money. So how does an economy um, of people uh, demand for money? So here we're talking about real money. Okay, so real money is also known as real balances. Okay, there's no fake money. So just let me tell you what is the definition of real money. Okay, so real money is basically the amount of money that they demand over the, the general price level. So P over here stands for the general price level in this economy. So why do we use real money demand? Well, that's because people care about their purchasing power uh, more than the amount of money that they have. So uh, the purchasing power tells them how, many, how much goods and services can their money buy. So that's more important to them, right? What's the worth of having a million dollars when you can only buy... Um, a pack of rice with one million dollars, right? So there are actually three motives of why people will want to hold money. And the first motive is a precautionary motive. So a simple way to explain a precautionary motive is um, money that people hold just in case, right? Just in case anything happens, they might need to use it. So um, it is actually independent of uh, interest rates as well as income, okay? so. Uh, these are variables that actually affect money demand in general, but uh, they do not affect the precautionary amount of money that people are willing to hold. So here's a sneak peek at how we graphically analyze money demand. So you've got interest rates on the vertical axis and the real money supply uh, or quantity on the horizontal axis. Okay, So um, the vertical axis is actually a nominal interest rates. Okay, And um, M over P is the quantity of real money. So as you can see from the two variables, income is an exogenous variable and interest rates is an endogenous variable because income is out of the graphs and interest rates is part of the graph on the vertical axis. We denote the quantity of money that people want to hold for precautionary motives as H0. Since the precautionary demand is not affected by interest rates or income, the precautionary motive is represented by this straight vertical line that you see over here. So that is the amount of money that people are demanding. The transactionary motive of holding money simply refers to the amount of money that people want to hold to spend, right? So this is actually dependent on the income level of the people, okay? So why does the income level affect this um, motive? Well, that's because when you earn more, 
you will want to hold more cash, right? I mean, that's just common sense. And when you're earning less money, um, you will want to hold less money because you don't really have that much money to hold, okay? So as you can see, there is actually a positive relationship between the real money demand and the income level. With that said, um, how we denote the transactionary motive is um, plus H1Y. So let's take a look at how H1Y will appear on um, the money demand graph. So it's going to be a vertical line that you see over here, but uh, because Y is an exogenous variable, okay, so once it increases, the entire vertical line is going to shift to the right, okay, and of course when it decreases, it's going to shift to the left. So this is how the money demand changes when there is a change in the income level of the economy. Now, the last motive is what we call the speculative motive. So what are people speculating? They are actually speculating whether they should postpone their consumption um, to a much later date. I mean, obviously, when you make your money, you don't want to spend everything today, right? You want to save so that you have some for tomorrow. So what we call this in economics terms is consumption smoothing. So people decide whether to spend more tomorrow or spend less tomorrow depends on the level of interest rates, right? So when interest rates rise, the opportunity cost of holding money rises as well. There is a higher opportunity cost because you are actually losing out on interest earning assets when you hold on to money. Money is not an interest earning asset. Your wallet or your piggy bank can't pay you interest, right? So as a result of higher interest rates and higher opportunity costs, you're going to be holding less money. So you'll be putting your money into interest earning assets instead of putting them with you. Okay, so the case whereby there is lower interest rates now, then the opportunity cost of holding that money actually decreases. Okay, so a rational person will actually want to hold more money now. So to hold more money, they simply sell um, whatever interest earning assets that they own at the moment. So when they sell it, they get cash in return, right? So that is how they're actually holding more money. So as you can see from this explanation over here, there is a negative relationship between um, the real money demand and the nominal interest rates. And we denote this by minus H2 times I. So the minus sign is there because there is a negative relationship. So how does this look like on the graph? Well, it is obviously a downward sloping curve. Uh, and basically how it works is that when your interest rates change, then um, your money demand is going to change uh, respectively, right? So when interest rates falls, then people are going to hold more money. Okay, when interest rates rise, then people hold less money. So that's how it works, okay? It's a movement along that curve. So now that we know the three motives of holding money, we can now look at the money demand function, okay, which is going to help you to derive your LM curve in the next video. So you just simply add up all three motives of um, holding money and you have the money demand function. See, it's actually very simple. So um, the money demand uh, function is also known as L, okay, uh, which is a function of Y. So L here actually stands for um, liquid assets. Okay, so I guess that's an easier way to remember it. So the dynamics of this curve is actually really very easy. Um, when there's a change in interest rate, which is an endogenous variable, then you know that there will be a movement along L. Okay? And when there is a um, change in income or a change in H0, these are exogenous variables, right? So there is going to be a shift of the money demand curve. Okay, cool. Let's take a quick look at the graph. So you've got um, nominal interest on the vertical axis and uh, real money on the horizontal axis. So that's my money demand function. And let's say that initially the interest rates level is at I0. This gives me a corresponding um, demand for real money as uh, M0 over P. Okay, so let's say when income rises, so H1 times Y is going to increase, right? This is the transactional motive of money. So when H1Y increases, then your entire L curve is going to shift to the right. Assuming that the interest rates has not changed, so this gives me a new money demand of M1 over P. Okay, so the intuition behind a shift is that at every level of interest rates, okay, more money is demanded now due to an increase in income. Okay, so the increase is basically the distance between um, the old and the new money demand. Okay, I'm not going to dwell so much into this graph because we're actually going to see it again in the next video when we are deriving the LM curve. So, now that we've got the demand side settled, we can now talk about the supply. Okay, the supply is uh, it's more fun, okay, in my opinion. So, there are basically different measures of money supply. If you had read your subject guide, you will notice that you've got um, definitions of money in terms of M0, M1, M2, M3, so on and so forth. 
So what are these things? So they are basically definitions of um, money supply. So M0 is actually the most narrow definition of money supply and as the number gets bigger, uh, the definitions become broader. So why are there um, narrow and broad definitions of money? Let's look at M0 to answer that question. So M0 actually refers to all the hard cash that are in this economy. So what's hard cash? Well, hard cash is really cash, right? So it's things like your notes and your coins and uh, they're circulated around the public. So uh, basically, it's the citizens that hold on to the cash. So we call this public cash, okay? And it also makes up of like reserves, reserves in the bank's vaults, which we denote as R. So when we go to M1, we have a broader definition of um, money. People can actually use their bank deposits to pay for certain goods and services, even if it's not in cash form. So what they do is that they use checks to pay, right? You know, you write a check to somebody for certain goods and services. So that is how the definition of money gets even more broad. Broader definitions of money even includes using your investment to pay for certain stuff. Okay, so the definition of M0 is your public cash plus your reserves, right? So um, it may look something like this. So M1 over here actually refers to your public cash plus your deposits. So public cash is public cash but your deposits is like a bigger portion of your reserves. And you should be asking yourself now, how can my reserves multiply into a bigger portion which is known as my deposits? So to answer that, we need to understand what is the fractional reserve banking system. So the fractional reserve banking system basically is um, the central bank. Okay, so the central bank is basically the bank of all the banks, right? It is the mother of all banks. So the banks better listen to what their mother says, right? So um, the central bank is going to say that you have to retain reserves in your bulk, all right? And the number of reserves will be basically a percentage of your customer's deposits. So to find out this percentage is quite simple. You just take the amount of reserves divided by the total amount of deposits and you get alpha percent. So let's just say that alpha percent is the amount that the um, central bank wants these other banks to maintain, okay? And this alpha percent is also known as the required reserve ratio. Okay, I'm going to use a story to actually explain to you how the supply of money in an economy is being derived. So let's say you have the US Central Bank, which is known as the Federal Reserve. Um, they decide to put K amount of money into a bank known as Merrill Lynch. So let's take a look at Merrill Lynch uh, balance sheet, shall we? So when the Central Bank puts K amount into Merrill Lynch, it becomes a liability to Merrill Lynch. It is a liability because the money doesn't really belong to Merrill Lynch. It is basically the Fed that is lending Merrill Lynch this money, right? So um, this K amount is also the first ever deposit that has been made into a bank. So we call it the one. So cash is also an asset to a bank. Why? Because the bank can actually use this cash to lend it out to other people and earn interest from it, right? So it's an asset to the bank. So before the bank actually lends this K amount of money out to people, it is kept as reserves in its vault. So that's why we call this K R1, reserve number one. Okay, let's say there's this guy that's called Mr. Money that comes to Merrill Lynch and wants to borrow some cash, right? So what's the maximum amount that Merrill Lynch can lend to Mr. Money? Well, it is one minus A times K. Well, that is because of the required reserve ratio that the central bank um, the Fed has imposed on Merrill Lynch, right? So the cent this Merrill Lynch can only lend a maximum of 1 minus alpha k. So let's just assume that Merrill Lynch decides to lend Mr. Money 1 minus alpha k. So after lending Mr. Money that amount of money, Merrill Lynch is now left with a reserve of alpha times k because 1 minus alpha has been gone, right? So this is the new R1. So Mr. Money then takes the first ever loan of L1 and he decides to deposit this in a bank called Goldman Sachs. So let's take a look at the balance sheet of Goldman Sachs. It is going to have a liability of 1 minus alpha times k, which is the second ever deposit in this economy. And again, that cash is an asset to Goldman Sachs because Goldman Sachs can actually lend this out to other people and earn interest on that. At the same time, the first ever loan made to Mr. Money by Merrill Lynch is also an asset to Merrill Lynch because he's going to be earning interest from Mr. Money. So we're going to put loan 1 under the asset portion of Merrill Lynch's balance sheet. So let's see if the balance sheet actually balances. So we're going to add up R1 and L1 together. And what you notice is you also get K, which balances with the liabilities portion. So Merrill Lynch is cleared. 
Now let's take a look at Goldman Sachs again. So Goldman Sachs is going to get some business from Mr. Cash. So Mr. Cash wants a loan from Goldman Sachs and the maximum amount that Goldman Sachs can lend to Mr. Cash is um, 1 minus alpha of the reserves that he can't really hold it. Well, this is again because of the required reserve ratio. Okay, so um, the second loan that is going to be made in this economy is going to be known as L2. And L2 is equal to the square of 1 minus alpha times K. So once Mr. Cash gets loan number 2 from Goldman Sachs, what he's going to do is going to deposit this cash into JP Morgan. So let's take a look at the balance sheet of JP Morgan, shall we? So you know that this loan that is being deposited into JP Morgan becomes a liability to JP Morgan and this is the third ever deposit um, that's made in this economy. At the same time, because it is cash, it is a form of reserve to JP Morgan, which is the third reserve R3. It is under the assets column of um, JP Morgan's balance sheet. So the loan that Goldman Sachs made to Mr. Cash, which is L2, is also an asset to Goldman Sachs. Why? Because it can earn Goldman Sachs some interest income. So therefore, loan 2 can be put under the asset column of Goldman Sachs balance sheet. So since Goldman Sachs has already lent out some money, the amount of reserves has obviously dropped. So the amount of reserves now is alpha multiplied by 1 minus alpha times k. So let's add up L2 and R2 so that we can see whether the balance sheet actually balances. Okay, so after some basic math, we notice that um, the asset portion actually balances with the liabilities portion. So Goldman Sachs is now cleared. So let's go back to JP Morgan. Uh, we're not going to introduce any more new people into this picture. But basically, a third loan that JP Morgan can make is basically 1 minus alpha of R3. Right? Again, this is due to the required reserve ratio. And L3 is then equals to the cube of 1 minus alpha times K. So after lending out this amount of money, what is left in JP Morgan's reserve is going to be R3, which is alpha times the cube of 1 minus alpha times K. And what you'll notice is that if you add L3 and R3 together, you're going to get D3. So the balance sheet of JP Morgan is cleared as well. So we can actually repeat this process for several more banks, but let's just stop at the third bank because uh, there's going to be a very long middle story if we just keep going on. So assuming that we've got many, many banks involved, let's add up all the deposits in this economy. Okay, so the total number of deposits is the sum of all the deposits, D1, D2, D3, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's D1, D1 is K, that's D2, and that's D3. So we'll just write down all the Ds that we have seen there. Okay, and so on and so forth. I'll factorize k out of this long string of uh, figures over here. And what I'm going to get is actually this over here. And the reason why I get this is because this whole chunk is actually um, the summation of an infinite geometric progression. So this is the basic math part. Okay, then I'm going to simplify the equation. And I know that the total amount of deposits is equal to k times 1 over alpha. Where 1 over alpha is known as a deposit multiplier. And K over here is the first ever reserve that was made in this economy. So we know that M1 equals to public cash plus deposit. From now on, when we talk about money supply, we are actually referring to M1. So the money supply is then equals to the public cash plus reserves multiplied by the deposit multiplier. So there you have it. You have a formula to calculate how much money there is in this economy. So we've done it. So here's a sneak peek at how the central bank can uh, manipulate the amount of money in this economy. So if the central bank is going to increase the required reserve ratio, the multiplier is going to fall, right? So therefore M1 falls. And when the central bank decreases the required reserve ratio, this increases the uh, money multiplier, which also causes the amount of money in this economy to increase. Well, the intuition behind this is actually pretty simple, right? I mean, if the banks, if the central bank requires all the banks to keep more money inside their vaults, and that, that means that there's lesser money circulating around the economy. So if the central bank now lets uh, banks lend out more of that cash inside their vaults, then there will be more money circulating the economy. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the loans, right? What about the loans? So let's add up all the loans that have been made in this economy and will also be made. So therefore, you've got L1, okay, you've got L2, and you've got L3, so on and so forth. Okay, so we'll just keep... Um, adding all these loans together. Okay, and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to factorize 1 minus alpha times k 
and I have another progressive uh, geometric progression over here. So I'm going to sum up the geometric progression to infinity, and this is what I get. So I'm just going to factorize some things around, okay, and I'm going to come up with something like this. So the amount of loans is basically k multiplied by the deposit multiplier minus 1. So the deposit multiplier minus 1 is also known as your loans multiplier, right? And k over here is the amount of reserve, right? It's the first um, reserve that is ever made into this economy. So with that known, let's look at what is the balance sheet of the public. So basically the balance sheet of um, the entire country, right? So under assets, you've got um, public cash and you've got deposits. And the liabilities, you have the loans that are uh, being made by people. So to calculate the net wealth of the public, you basically take the assets and you minus the liabilities away from it. So it's PC plus D minus L. So I'm going to expand um, D and L into their respective equations. And what you'll notice is that the net wealth of this economy is going to be equals to public cash plus the reserves, okay, which is actually M0. So what does this mean? This means that the amount of hard cash and reserves actually determine the amount of public wealth. Therefore, increasing the money supply M1 does not really make the public better off or wealthier in terms of um, net wealth, right, if you look at the balance sheet in this way. So the central bank can change the money supply um, either by changing the required reserve ratio or changing the amount of reserves. Okay, so uh, that's about it for this video on the demand and supply of money. I hope you've enjoyed it, especially the story of the banks. So with that, I want to thank you for studying with Quick Economics. In the next video, we're going to talk about deriving the LM curve. Take care.